Okay, good morning everyone, um, or good afternoon in Malaysia, and uh, welcome to today's Taster Lecture. Um, my name is Jeremy Histon, I'm based at the International Schools Partnership Head Office in London, um, but um, obviously we're speaking to you during a period of lockdown, unfortunately, so I'm at home as um, indeed you all are, so I'd like to start by wishing you all well, I hope you and your families are are safe and well and, and getting through this um, challenging period uh, wherever you are. Um, I'd just like to highlight that I'm recording this session um, because uh, for pros prosperity, but also because we're going to be sharing it with the other regions in the ISP network. So we have schools in 12 different countries around the world. Um, but um, Malaysia is where we're hosting these um, lectures. Um, so you get the benefit of, of a live lecture and you're able to speak to our, our guest lecturer later on. We'll uh, keep you on mute during the lecture, but at the end we'll uh, let you ask some questions. You can always type questions into the chat box as well and um, we'll answer those at the end. So without any further ado, I'd like to um, welcome Professor Will Harvey. Um, from the University of Exeter Business School. Will is the Associate Dean of Research and Impact and Professor of Management, and he's going to be speaking to us today uh, about white collar crime. Um, I'd also like to welcome Rebecca Hill, who is the Head of International Student Recruitment at the University of Exeter Business School. And uh, Rebecca is going to be speaking to us after Will's uh, delivered his lecture uh, to give you some more um, more of an overview of the university and business school. So if you have any questions about studying at Exeter, I'm sure Rebecca will be happy to help um, and give you a good picture of the University of Exeter Business School. So enough from me. I think let me hand over to Will. Welcome, Will. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, yeah, if you want to take control of the screen and, and share your slides, that'd be great. Thank you. Hello everyone and hello Jeremy, thank you uh, very much for this kind invitation. Let me just um, put things into uh, full screen mode. Just want to check, can you see what I'm, can you see the, the slides at the moment? Jeremy, can you see Not that? Not yet, no. No, let me just try again. Um, let me just see. Just trying to share the screen. Just let me know if you can see yes. it when you can. You That's can now. Got it, yeah. Okay, just bear with me. I'm just going to put that onto full. Great. Okay, hopefully that's in full screen now. What I'd like to talk to you all about uh, today is white collar crime and sustainability. And what I'm going to do is give you kind of a mini lecture, really, to give you a flavour of the kind of content and the type of uh, discussions we would have in a lecture here at the University of Exeter Business School. So what I'm going to talk about, first of all, is well, what do we understand by reputation? Why should we care about it as a topic? And then I'm going to finish with two case studies that I have done research on, uh, one related to sustainability and the other uh, related to white collar crime. So reputation is something which is really important, but is what's known as intangible, which means it's not something physical that you can see like um, a MacBook or an iPad or an iPhone or, or a can of Coca-Cola, which is tangible. Um, it's something what's known as intangible. Uh, and this is where it's really important, because even though it's not something physical, it does have significant value for organisations and for individuals. Uh, and reputation is also something that can be an asset uh, or a liability. Uh, and what I mean by that is when it's an asset, uh, if you've got a very positive reputation as a company, let's take Apple uh, Inc. as an example, well, then it's uh, of great value um, in terms of people assume that you have high quality products, um, that you're reliable, you have a good relationship with your customers. But we also have, unfortunately, lots of examples uh, of organisations that have experienced scandals. 
uh, and there your reputation becomes a liability. Um, the third thing I wanted to say about reputation is in most cases it's relative to something. So think about the reputation of Coca-Cola versus Pepsi-Cola. Or let's say you're a migrant and you're thinking, well, what's the reputation of Malaysia as a country, as an expatriate versus, let's say, the United Arab Emirates? So always people are making perceptions of an organization or a place in, in, in most cases in relation to something else. The fourth thing I wanted to say about reputation is actually, and this is one of the most challenging, it's a perception, not a fact. It's what people think about an organization, or maybe it's a university, your perception of the University of Exeter. Uh, and often those perceptions may, may link to facts, but they're not always the same as facts. And the final thing I wanted to say about reputation is it's actually quite sticky, meaning that once you have a reputation for something, it actually can be quite difficult to shift that, both in a positive uh, and a negative way. And that's an important take home for all of us as individuals to think about our own individual reputations and how it's important to manage those. So that's a little bit of uh, background on reputation. What, why should leaders uh, of organisations care about it? Well, coming back to the positives, uh, if you've got a really positive reputation, then you have an ability to charge high prices. Think about, let's say, a company like Ferrari. Uh, it has a very high reputation in a very high niche area. And not surprisingly, it has the ability uh, to charge very high prices for its products. Um, and there are lots of organizations from IT companies to food products to going to a restaurant where once you get a certain level of reputation, one of the things that enables you to do is charge high prices. Second, it enables you to attract and retain uh, talent, good employees, because people want to work for organisations that have a positive reputation. And your existing workforce will want to stay working with you if you have a positive reputation, which is why we talk about retention. We also have lots of examples of organisations that have gained a reputation for something, let's say a, a big accounting firm like PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, ha has gained for, for decades a, a very positive reputation in, uh, let's say, taxation and audit, but it's over time started to pivot into new markets, let's say management consulting, strategy consulting, and that's because it's gained a reputation in one area and it's slowly started to move into another area. And I think it's really interesting um, during the coronavirus uh, pandemic that we've seen organisations do this very, very quickly. Um, so the example that comes to mind in the UK is the Formula One company McLaren and how uh, they have been assisting um, in producing ventilator machines for our National Health Service. And so that's an example of not a permanent shift, but the way in which organisations can quickly pivot into new areas. But of course, uh, reputation can be negative as well, and it can have long lasting impact. The diagram there you can see it is the example of VW, which was embroiled and continues to be embroiled in a big um, uh, scandal in relation to um, em emissions uh, data that it falsely produced uh, related to a lot of its automobiles. Um, in sort of the best case scenario of a scandal, sometimes organisations have their reputation damaged. In worst case scenarios, it can destroy businesses, and that has a serious implication uh, on people. So that's why we should care about reputation. So without um, uh, further ado, let's go straight into the first case study then. Uh, this is a case study um, of Rio Tinto in Madagascar. So Rio Tinto is a large global mining company that operates all over the world. Um, and um, typically mining companies are extracting um, minerals um, from, uh, from underground. And so in the 1980s, uh, Rio Tinto started exploring off the eastern part of Madagascar. So Madagascar uh, is off uh, the southern tip of uh, the African continent. Um, it's one of uh, the richest countries in terms of biodiversity, but it's one of the poorest countries in terms of its economy. And so, as you can see here, what we've got is this challenge where suddenly you've got a big global mining company that's identified a, a mineral and you've got a very, very poor African country. And you can see that there, there's clearly you know, a reputational uh, challenge here. 
So um, some mineral sand deposits were found in the very southern part of uh, Madagascar in a, in a region called uh, Fort Dauphin, which is uh, kind of in the orange coloured area right at the bottom of that um, visual that you can see. And um, this next photograph gives you an idea of, of the area that we visited. So the mineral you can see in black here is a mineral known as ilmenite which um, is incredibly pure. And so I remember when it was poured through my hands, even though the color of the mineral was sort of jet black, no stain whatsoever was left on my hands. Now this um, mineral is uh, ironically, even though it's black, actually used in a lot of products which are white. So white paint, white toothpaste, for instance. So it's a product that is in very, very high demand uh, all over the world. And so um, none of this infrastructure that you can see in this aerial photograph uh, existed before. All the roads had to be built, all the refineries. You can see at the sort of back of um, uh, the photograph, you've got these kind of dredging um, uh, machines as well. So all of this kind of infrastructure had to be built by uh, Rio Tinto. Um, which, uh, as you can imagine, was logistically very challenging, but also in terms of managing operating in a very poor country and in a country that has a high level of biodiversity, uh, very, very um, uh, challenging in terms of managing their reputation. And here are some of the challenges. So obviously, um, <clears throat> you may know that um, Madagascar, uh, like parts uh, of Malaysia as well, has um, a lot of primary rainforest, uh, as well as uh, uh, endangered lemurs, the, the animal in, in, in the photograph um, towards the bottom. And so uh, here you can imagine what you start to experience is uh, several non-government organisations getting very unhappy with the, the prospect of either displacement of the animals or the logging of, <clears throat> excuse me, primary rainforest, which um, of course takes uh, decades, if not centuries um, to, to, to replace and therefore is, is not something that would be seen as positive in terms of sustainability, particularly in an era of um, <clears throat> climate change. So here's just one quotation from one uh, international NGO, the Friends of the Earth, and destroying these unique forests for the sake of a quick profit is madness. The international community should mobilize resources for developments that will help and not wreck the local economy and irreplaceable wildlife. And there were lots of these quotations and media coverage around um, sort of uh, pushing back on, on um, Rio Tinto operating in, in this part of the world. The photograph there at the bottom, you can see these are some examples of the housing that Rio Tinto was um, building for um, its workers. So again, none of that infrastructure was there before. That was uh, put in place as part of um, uh, the contract between Rio Tinto uh, and the national government. And most people, as I said, are living in very poor conditions, would not have had proper shelter at all. So those houses there would be uh, a, would be a, a significant step up for many of these people. And there's uh, another photograph that can help you to sort of imagine the challenges of if you've got people living in these kinds of areas and then suddenly you've got Rio Tinto coming in and then starting to dredge the minerals from under uh, the surface through this sort of major dredge machine, uh, you can clearly uh, imagine the types of disruption that causes uh, to people uh, on the ground. Uh, and I was um, fortunate to, to interview a lot of different stakeholders uh, in the region. But um, uh, Rio Tinto did some uh, very good things. And you'll notice I've used the term QMM because QMM is the subsidiary of Rio Tinto. So that was the name of the company in Madagascar. But for all intents and purposes, it's part of Rio Tinto. Um, one very clever thing that Rio Tinto did was it recognised that it needed to work closely with some of these different stakeholders. And so the lady you see in the middle of this photograph, Manon Vincelet, who we uh, interviewed, she was a very active uh, botanist who previously worked for Conservation International, which uh, is a, a large international uh, non-government organisation. And uh, I have to say, she was the sort of person that would not hold back her punches. She felt very passionately uh, about preserving the environment uh, and looking after the region. And she felt that if by working inside a mining company, she could 
achieve a lot more than outside uh, as an activist. Uh, and this, uh, I think, started a really fruitful period where you see a much better relationship between the organisation and some of those key stakeholders. So, for instance, you've got powerful chiefs in the region who are really influential on the community. You've got local and national politicians. Uh, QMM also built up some strong relationships with Kew Gardens, which is a big botanical garden in, in West London, as well as other organisations such as BirdLife International. And this is, gives you some ideas of some of the initiatives on the ground in Madagascar. So um, you can see uh, at the bottom diagram photograph, there's, uh, uh, which doesn't really capture the true breadth, but there is a variety of different seeds, uh, which are very rare, um, that are um, uh, then uh, propagated, as you can see in the in the top photograph, where they're starting to grow some of these into plants, some of which will be replanted in the region. Others are passed on to other parts of the world as well. And the, and the person in the photograph at the, at the top is a guy called Johnny, who was head of flora, biodiversity and ecological restoration. He was hired from um, Missouri Botanical Gardens in, in the United States. So again, there were lots of really interesting initiatives that I think the company were doing to try and bring in people to help sort of preserve um, um, the, the rainforest. And uh, one of the things that they decided very early on is whether they found minerals under the rainforest or not, what they were not going to do was cut down any rainforest. So if, if I go back a few slides again, this photograph here, as you may probably notice, it's kind of um, it, sort of the liminal space between the, the, the ocean um, uh, and the land. This is not rainforest area where they're dredging. And so they made kind of a, a, a key strategic decision there that they didn't want to kind of undermine that. Um, and you can see some of the different initiatives that they adopted from large tree nurseries, seed storage and propagations, and also helping to preserve different types of animals as well. OK, so um, these are the kind I'm going to give you a, a set of three different questions, which um, you were welcome to chat about um, uh, after I've, I've finished the talk. But these would be the kinds of questions then in a lecture within Exeter, I would start to kind of foster and sometimes get people to break off into into groups and then come back and share their insights in front of the class. So the first question is, what are the ethical risks associated with the QMM mining project? So I might say to a couple of teams, right, OK, if you want to go and focus on those ones. And then a second question is, should conservation or development take priority? In other words, should we preserve the, the environment at all costs, even if it means that it holds us back in terms of economic development? As I mentioned before, Madagascar is a very poor country which should take priority. That would be for another set of groups uh, to have a discussion on. And a third question would be, what role should large mining companies such as Rio Tinto play in sustainability? I've given some examples here. This would be something that I'd get groups to start to discuss. So these, I hope, are sort of important intellectual questions, but also really important practical questions that are highly relevant to businesses today. OK, so that's the first case study. Let me then move on um, to the second case study and then very happy to open things up uh, for general questions and comments. So I want to talk about losing reputation um, and in the context of uh, white collar crime. And you can see some photographs here on the right hand side of several different high prominent people around the world who have been very successful in their careers and have ended up um, in prison for white collar crime, which would be things like financial fraud, tax fraud, cyber fraud. These are not violent criminals. White collar crime is typically um, kind of non-violent um, crimes of the of the types that I've just described. So uh, without going into the cases of, of each individual, let me just pick the person at the bottom in, in the green um, prison scrubs. That's uh, Jeffrey Skilling, who in the last six months or so has just come out of prison. Uh, he was the chief executive of Enron, which um, was one of the largest um, financial scandals in US and, uh, and world history. Uh, really. Uh, Enron was seen and, and lauded as a very successful energy company. 
um, and you can read all kinds of books and documentaries and films on Enron, um, but it uh, ended up um, being embroiled in all kinds of complex scandals uh, around financial forecasting, um, tr essentially trying to trick the market into how it was performing compared to what, how it really was performing. And Jeff Skillings and Kenneth Lay, who was the chairman of Enron, uh, were both uh, indicted by uh, the US federal government. So we often hear about these people uh, in the newspapers and pretty much every day we come across these kinds of people. And so my PhD student Navdeep Arora uh, and me were, were really interested in reflecting on when these people are actually in prison. Maybe this represents an opportunity for us to ask them the kinds of things such as why and how did they do this? Uh, and secondly, uh, what can organisations do to prevent this type of activity, which can have a huge financial impact on organisations, but also can have a big impact uh, on society as a whole, because often taxpayers uh, end up having to pick up the tab. So with that in mind, uh, Namdeep and I um, set out a research question which you can see in the writing here, which is why and how do individuals commit professional misconduct? And let me just give you a, a little bit of details uh, around um, the types of data that we collected on this project before telling you what we found. So we were really fortunate, and I don't know of any study uh, around the world that has basically had access to a United States federal prison where we interviewed uh, 70 different inmates of the prison three times for about three hours each, uh, all of whom had committed white collar crime. We also did 20 focus groups, which is where you bring a, a small number of those people together to have a bit more discussion. And so we did this between August of 2018 and, and November of last year, 2019. And as I said, these are all people that had been incarcerated in a, an American prison for white collar crime. Their, their age ranged from 27 to 71. Their median age was 47. And these are people working or who were working in a variety of fields. These were chief executives of business. These are investment and fund managers, management consultants. These are doctors people working in uh, real estate development, their accountants, their technology people, entrepreneurs, government leaders. So a whole range. So please don't sort of stereotype these people as one type in one particular sector. This is a very broad range of people, which I think makes it so interesting to understand uh, what caused them to commit these types of crimes. So we created this enormous table of 70 rows that kind of represented the characteristics of each of these individuals. Now, one thing you should understand from an ethical point of view is that it is vital when you're doing interviews not to disclose the identity of the individual um, or uh, of the organisation, which is why I haven't told you what the prison was or where the prison was. I won't mention any names, but what we did do is create a table, and this is just kind of three lines of the table, which kind of gives you some interesting data around the, some of the characteristics of these people. So you can see on the left hand side of the table, there's kind of a subject code, which is where we coded everyone from one to 70. You can see their age, their education, what type of company they were working in, the size of it, whether it was prominent or not. In other words, was it well known? Um, what was the cause of their reputation damaging event? And at the point that we interviewed them in the prison, how long was it since they had actually committed that crime? So didn't really want to go into any more detail other than to show you that we kind of got a lot of that kind of data, which is really important when trying to understand the causality of uh, professional misconduct. So what I just wanted to do now is just talk you through a, a few of the factors and then try and give you a bigger picture of what explains professional misconduct. So one of the factors was what we term burden of custodianship. And here's a quotation from one of the prisoners. With 35 employees on our payroll, we were also responsible for their families. So more than 100 people at least. As the construction market tanked, so did our revenue from construction supplies. We could not make payroll. So I moved money from employee benefit and retirement accounts to payroll. It was short term fix and we hoped the business would pick back up within a year. It took much longer 
and then it was too late. And so here's an example of someone that's clearly actually ironically trying to protect the families and the employees by moving money from essentially a pension pot into their payroll because they obviously had a cash flow problem in terms of paying their employees. And this obviously accumulated over time until it got to the point where it was unsustainable or the person got caught. Let me give you another quotation, and this one is really related to overcompensation for their perceived deficiencies. I was not a rock star in school and grew up wanting to show my parents and siblings what I could achieve. When I joined the real estate firm, the pressure to perform even got higher. The bar I set for myself was so much above what was expected of me, but I didn't realize that till the damage was done. I pushed myself to do things no one expected or wanted me to do. So this is a really interesting quotation, and we had a lot of data of this, where people often set themselves a particular standard, which was really self-imposed. It wasn't really imposed by others, but it was something that they set upon themselves because in other parts of their lives, they felt they, they were not kind of delivering to the standards they wanted. So almost they were overcompensating in their professional fields. And then thirdly, we've got a quotation around personal beliefs and values. Startups have to be able to tell a compelling story and you make things up as you go about capabilities, customers who want to buy your products and sales pipeline. Otherwise, it's very difficult to get funded. I can point you to 20 successful companies that followed that exact route to get funded. They succeeded and it never came out. We didn't and got caught. And so here you can see that this person feels a degree of resentment because what he's essentially saying is other people are doing very similar practices to what he was doing and he got caught. He, he feels that this is sort of almost part of the game uh, of operating as a startup where you're trying to get money and funding from other people. It just so happens that he got caught. So those are kind of three factors. Um, what I want to show you now is a kind of a bigger picture where, as you can see, three of those factors come into the diagram on the blue circles here. And essentially what we found were when we're trying to understand misconduct, we found six kind of major factors. And let me just quickly talk through those six factors. And of course, what I'm doing here is just giving you a tiny, tiny bit of the data. Um, we have absolutely tons of data that kind of reinforces uh, these points. So the first one I've already mentioned around burden of custodianship, and this is really where a lot of these people felt they had a responsibility for a diverse set of stakeholders. But ironically, by trying to protect some of those people, they actually ended up uh, being embroiled in a scandal. The second is a lot of these people um, talked about fear of failure. In other words, there was a lot of pressure on them within their organizations to deliver and often the people they worked for were um, willing to turn a blind eye for certain things that were potentially unethical and so there was a sort of degree of self-preservation amongst some of these people now number three is a very popular reason that we often um, explain for misconduct people often just talk about ego and hubris that it's really about the individual and there was, to some extent, some of that, this aspect around greed, people feeling that they're invincible to uh, the law, for instance. Um, but it was a relatively smaller factor compared to some of the others. I mentioned number four already, that there's an overcompensation for perceived deficiencies. Sometimes it was a substitute for happiness. Lots of these people, for example, had very uh, sad personal circumstances, uh, either having um, gone through a divorce, family members dying, in some cases even uh, children committing suicide, some, some really, really tragic personal circumstances, which clearly had an impact on people's kind of ethical code of conduct. Number five, lack of information, capacity and capability to res respond to mistakes. So sometimes people just felt they, they were insulated, they were kind of operating in a, in a bubble. And then the final factor, number six, personal beliefs and values. Uh, as we heard already with the final quotation I gave, people said, well, other people are doing it. So what's wrong? You know, I just happen to be the person uh, that was caught. So what's important here, and this segues into the next slide, is that these six factors often don't operate in isolation. There is sometimes an interaction effect 
um, between them. Uh, and what this diagram does here is if you remember those six bubbles at the bottom, well, um, uh, they're now represented, um, uh, sorry, the six bubbles, blue uh, bubbles are represented on the bottom of this diagram. And what I wanted to flag to you here is that um, 87 percent of these uh, respondents cited two, three or four of the triggers uh, as being um, a reason for why they acted unethically. And I think what's perhaps even more interesting from this study is the fact that if you remember, I said that we were doing interviews and focus groups. We weren't conducting a survey. And so it is if we were to have asked these people these six questions uh, in terms of whether they were a cause of their misconduct, I would hypothesize that you would have even higher scores here. So the reason we got to these scores is because we coded transcripts of the interview that these factors uh, were coming through. And I would suggest that if it was a survey, it would come through uh, much more strongly. OK, so just to summarise the findings here, um, I guess the first insight really would be that individuals rarely set out to commit professional misconduct. This is not often like a preordained type of process. And sometimes I think we can be forgiven for thinking that because we read sensationalist um, newspaper articles or headlines on uh, on broadcasts where we get this feeling that this person is innately bad, that they were born to commit crime. But I guess the kind of scary take home that I want to give to you and to all of us is that any of us actually could fall into this situation. And so that's what, what I refer to under point one is sleepwalking across ethical lines, because there are a series of individual circumstances um, uh, and as well related to the organisation that can have an impact on whether we're likely to act unethically or not. The second point I wanted to make, which I alluded to earlier, is that we often talk about greed, that the reason that these people did this was because of greed. And yes, greed is a factor, but we would argue that greed is an over exaggerated motivator of professional misconduct. Not to say it's unimportant or irrelevant, no, but as going back to those six points before, on the basis of our data, and again, just to, to reiterate, the data is so rich and it's just such a unique access to people who are able to give us such a candid insight that I think it gives a very, very strong reason when people are reflecting in prison on their mistakes of why people act unethically. And finally, you may have picked this up already. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we often see when, we, when reporting happens around misconduct is that we want to scapegoat someone. And we always see this, whether it's a political scandal, an economic scandal, it's something in a community. We, we love to kind of put people on a pedestal when things are going well, and we love to bring people down when something goes wrong. And the problem with that in terms of understanding misconduct is that it kind of has this underlying assumption that it's always just the individual. Going back to that point I made before that the individual is innately bad, it's them. But actually, what we found from our data is that there are a series of organisational factors that interact with those individual triggers that I alluded to that help to drive unethical behaviour. So, for example, if you've got a very toxic organisational culture where certain types of incentives are created or certain types of behaviours are ignored, then in a way, as an organisation, what you're doing is saying to your employees that that kind of behaviour is OK, even if you're not saying it. By not doing something when someone acts unethically, you're essentially saying that kind of practice is OK. We see that as OK. And so that's what we mean by the fact that kind of things happen at an organisational level and at an individual level in, in tandem. Those two things have an impact on whether people are likely to act unethically. OK, Jeremy, I'm going to hand you back to you shortly, uh, but just to say uh, a couple more things. One, uh, this is just to flag uh, an article that was published in the Financial Times, which was based on this project that I was just telling you about. Andrew Hill in the photograph here, he's uh, worked at the Financial Times, I think, since the 1980s, very prominent management editor. Um, and so it's great to see this kind of coverage coming through um, there. 
And then the final thing I really wanted to, to tell uh, all of you as a kind of a take home from both the case studies is sort of four things really about reputation, which has been the overarching theme. Point one is that clearly I hope what you've seen today is reputation is not just something that we talk about in the classroom or in a lecture hall, that this is something that is really relevant across so many types of facets of society. And therefore, we as individuals and as managers and leaders of organisations, we need to manage it carefully. The second point is that reputation is important, but requires an understanding of your behaviours. OK, so if, if you're a manager or a leader of an organisation, of course, you need to be thinking about the rankings and your financial performance, but your individuals are an important part of your brand. Think about, let's say you walk into a hotel and the importance of the person at the front desk or the concierge in terms of how they present themselves, how they look, how they engage with you. They're part of your employee base and they have an impact on how I, as a customer of that hotel, perceive that hotel. If you start talking about other types of businesses like professional service firms, well, you don't necessarily have a physical product. Everything that you deliver is a service. So your people are your product. So in order to look after your reputation, you need to understand the behaviours of your employees. The third point I wanted to say is that often what a lot of businesses do is react to a reputation problem when it occurs. And what I think is the most important thing to take away about reputation is that you have to constantly proactively engage with it so that um, you're not just firefighting a problem, but you're constantly thinking about how your reputation is evolving and what you can do to manage it. And the final point I wanted to say about reputation is that even though it's tempting to think that it's always fair, your reputation, it's always factual, and rational. Actually, as we know through social media, through mass media, through informal conversations people have, it's often actually about perception. And that means that even though it's not always fair, it does mean there's a lot you can do as an organisation and you as an individual managing your own reputation to ensure that the perception others have of you and your organisation is what you intend. And what I always do at the end of my lectures is just uh, also include all the different types of references and further readings uh, that might be useful. I'm happy to pass this slide deck uh, on to Jeremy if, if it's helpful for everyone. Um, Jeremy, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, Will. That's really good. Um, fascinating subjects you get to study in your <laughs> line of work. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, if any of you can see there's a chat box, um, you're able to type in questions, but there's also a, a raise your hand button. Um, if you want to click on that and, and then unmute yourself and ask a question, that's fine. Um, I'll give people a, a second just to think of questions if they like. Um, I'd be interested, Will, actually, just going back to the, the uh, Rio Tinto case. Um, you asked the question around should conservation or development take priority? And I guess my my instinct would be there's got to be a balance there somewhere, hasn't there? But in in the case of Madagascar, what's the situation today in terms of how has that panned out um, with Rio Tinto? Is it is it still a happy balance of you know they've obviously gone in and built infrastructure and built housing, which has benefited everyone there? Is it, is it all carrying on so well? Um, it's been a an ongoing challenge. Um, and this is something that I think is always difficult um, to manage because every organisation has different stakeholders that it has to sort of engage with. Um, and so in the case of Rio Tinto, you know, it's a it's publicly listed on two different stock markets. So one of your stakeholders is your shareholders. And often they care a lot about the financial performance of the business. And then obviously you've got employees. But but in, in the case of Madagascar, um, it's been politically unstable for quite some time with um, significant shifts in national government. Um, so that has been, uh, I think, a, a big challenge. But one of the things that I think big mining and energy companies have learned 
by a lot of mistakes that have happened in the 1980s, 1990s, it, particularly in Africa, is that they're in for a long term relationship. These types of contracts are often 40, 50 years. And so they need to manage those stakeholder relationships carefully. I would say in general, what I wouldn't paint is a perfect picture because I, I don't think perfection you know, exists uh, regardless of whether it was a mining company or any other company. But I do think there are some good practices that this um, company has kind of operated. I think one of the big challenges on the human side is if you can imagine you've got this local agrarian rural economy that has very, very few um, uh, people in any kind of employment. And then suddenly you've got thousands of people being employed at a fairly low rate by global standards. It wreaks havoc with the local economy. So what you start to experience in the region is kind of the haves versus the have nots. And that starts to kind of manifest at the weekends where some people might be going out and buying things and other people who are not employed by Rio Tinto can't. And um, also there are issues around inflation because suddenly you've got a, a, a lot of people that can afford to pay a bit more for things and that ends up being very expensive for those people that are not employed. So there's a lot of this sort of micro level sort of people challenges that require very careful proactive management from Rio Tinto. But I would say in the benefit of hindsight, they've done a pretty good job. But of course, there are things retrospectively they could have done better as well. Great. OK, thank you. Um, I can see. Can you see the chat box there, Will, on your screen? Is, uh, I, I can't. I can see the people, but I can't seem to click on the, the chat. Oh, OK. Um, well, we have you questions. Read the chat, I'm yeah. happy to answer. Lu Jian Chuan has asked, is it possible to combine development and conservation as something to prioritise altogether? Um, yeah. And Tala has got a question here. How do you build up a positive influential reputation as a startup company? Great questions. Uh, so so uh, with the first one, I think you're, you're spot on that um, conservation and development don't need to be set as kind of an either or. And in fact, um, one of the things that we've been really trying to emphasize in Exeter is uh, the, the power of the circular economy um, as, a, as a, a really valuable kind of resource. And the idea of the circular economy is that so much of what we do in life is treat products as kind of linear. In other words, that we extract something, we use it, and then we put it in landfill. And there's no kind of cost to basically putting it in the landfill other than the cost that future generations are going to have to deal with. And so that's what's known as kind of a linear economy. And increasingly what the circular economy movement is saying is that everything that we consume has to be designed from the outset with the view that it can be reused again. So let's think of a really mundane example like a washing machine, right? So rather than historically, or even right now, you buy a washing machine until it breaks, and then either you have to dispose of it, or when you get a new one, the company picks it up, and then they have to dispose of it. But either way, it still has to be disposed of some way. Um, but another way of thinking about it is that it's leased. So let's say the company, let's say it's Samsung, right? You buy a Samsung or a Bosch washing machine. Instead, now, what, what happens is they would lease that to you, but they're going to now design it in a way that those parts can be reused again in new products. So they take the product back away from you once it's finished and all those parts can be reused into a new product. So at the moment of design, they've got a, a financial incentive to think about how to reuse every aspect of that product into a new product rather than basically handing something over to the consumer who's then going to dispose of it themselves. And so I think that comes to that first question about trying to sort of balance the kind of the environmental and the economic by thinking differently about the whole model uh, of how things uh, operate. And the, the second question was about startup reputation, right? Yeah. It's a, gr a great question because often um, when you're a startup, you don't have a reputation. 
uh, or you have a limited reputation. And so um, two tactics that are often used are what's known as reputation borrowing and reputation by endowment. Um, so reputation um, borrowing is where, for example, you might um, uh, link with uh, a series of people or partners who might already have quite a strong reputation in a related field. And so you might partner with them. Maybe they would be endorsing your products. Maybe they might help for a few months just to kind of increase the prominence of your business. Um, at the, the other area would be not so much aligning with an individual, but you might actually partner with an organization for a short period of time. Uh, and the idea with both of those, uh, and if you're interested in more reading around that, uh, there's a Professor Petkova, P-E-T-K-O-V-A. She works at uh, San Francisco University. Um, she's written a lot about how startups build their reputation. But um, reputation borrowing and reputation endowment, essentially aligning with a, another person or another business, can be a really useful way of increasing kind of your visibility in the market because that's the hardest thing that businesses struggle with is just getting your name out there people hearing about you and so if you can get kind of like a, a leg up in that respect uh, then those are kind of two tactics that can work quite effectively great thank you will uh, i think that's it for the questions for the moment but what we'll do we'll, we'll let the uh, students think about it and our colleagues in malaysia can always send on some questions well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been brilliant. Sure. Um, I'm sure. going to hand over to Rebecca because she's waiting patiently there to tell us more about the University of Exeter Business School in general. Um, so, Rebecca, please take it away. Rebecca, you are mute. Hello, can you hear me now? Yep, Excellent. Um, what I loved about Will's lecture was actually everything you can do, you can start combining sustainability and business as an undergraduate student. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes on the University of Exeter's business school, but if you do have any questions, I'm more happy to answer these afterwards for you. We are very much about leadership for a better world. As you saw from Will's lecture, it's about thinking in different ways that you may not have thought about seeing an idea from multiple perspectives and studies. As a university, our business school is taught over two campuses, one in Cornwall, which is where sustainability is also taught, uh, renewable energy, and then our Stretton campus in Exeter. We're in the beautiful southwest of the UK and our most famous alumni is JK Rowling. The city of Exeter is a historic city going back to medieval times, but we've also got lots of modern shops, cafes, restaurants and green spaces. As a city, it's very safe. The students also tell me it's very good for social life, overall experience, and the total population is 125,000. In terms of our university, we're a campus-based university and we're about 15 minutes from the city centre. I'm gonna show you a quick video of the university. OK, my video is not working. I'll send it to you later. Uh, also, this is our Penryn campus. And as you can see, really beautiful. Both our campuses are very close to the sea. When you're looking for a university and you're deciding what university, the most influential universities in the UK belong to the Russell Group because they are the leading research intensive universities. We're also top 150 in the world. We're also very good at teaching and that's when you know a university is good at teaching because it has TEF gold. We're the fastest growing research university, so you're leading from academics of cutting edge research. We're also a triple accredited business school. There's only 100 business schools globally that have this, and this makes up about 1% of all business schools. Why Exeter Business School? When you're looking at our rankings, and rankings aren't everything, but they are important. 
all of our undergraduate degrees with the complete university guide are in the top five. There's over 106 nationalities studying together. So actually we're a very diverse cohort of students and staff at the university. But most importantly, we are number one in terms of graduate destinations. So we put a lot of um, help into helping you find jobs. You can also ensure you can do a work placement as part of your degree. Many of our courses will also have additional accreditation, such as our accountancy and finance courses, which have maximum exemptions from ACCA and other professional bodies. How do you get a good degree? We know that actually globally the world is going through quite a tough time. Disruption hasn't happened over a 10 year period. Disruption has happened really quickly. And COVID has been a black swan that's affected many businesses. We've had to change how we work. You're changing how you're doing schooling. So coming out and studying through this period, what things you need to think about? Well, first of all, getting a good degree, academic, academic rigor, critical thinking, research skills. You also need to look at your personal transferable skills. The fact that you've adapted from in classroom to online learning is a very good skill to have. You'll also have to work in teams. The great thing about team working is you bring together everybody's strengths and then you can see your ideas and you'll also develop cultural awareness, intelligence and be more enterprising. We'll also help you write your CV. So when you graduate, you may decide to opt to stay in the UK and work for two years. So you might want to write a CV for the UK market or for your home market. We'll also help you with interview skills, assessment centres and psychometric tests. Taking part in work experience, whether it's um, formal or informal, related to your field or not, is really useful. The other thing is, and I find this when I'm interviewing people, be passionate about why you want to work in this job and this employer. Combine these together, you will get a graduate level job. We'll also bring lots of employers onto our campus, such as Disney, Unilever, big banks for us like Lloyd's, uh, hospitality industry, so you can find out what kind of jobs are available. Meeting the employers in both formal one-to-ones, but also informal after the guest lectures having a LinkedIn profile and making sure your picture doesn't look like your Instagram picture. It can be quite important so we can help you with this professional visit. We'll also take you to employers and help you with mock interviews. So what degrees can you do? We've got three main subject areas. They are accounting and finance, business management, economics, but also flexible combined honours. So you can combine two or three subjects. They might be within our school or they might be within another college. One of these options could be management and sustainability. So combining what we were talking about earlier. When you're choosing our degrees, some of our degrees will give you high degree of flexibility in terms of modules. Others will have less flexibility. So one popular degree in Malaysia is accounting and finance, but students could also combine accounting with business. So you'll be able to combine a few more modules incorporating finance, business management, as well as modules in law if you wanted to. When you're looking at business management, our main degree is business and management where you have a high degree of flexibility. But for those students who have more of a creative flair, you might want to combine it with business and marketing. Another growing area is analytics. Everything that we do, businesses are driven by data. I spend a lot of my time looking at data to inform me of decisions, deciding which markets we visit. Actually, I love Africa, but I can't spend that much time in Africa because in reality, I have to spend a lot of my time in Asia where most of our students will travel from. So looking at that, what cities do we go to? We'll also then, so having this and extracting that data and being data driven is so important to so many businesses. Also finances, businesses at the moment are having to rechange their budgets, look at how they're managing because of COVID disruption. If you want to look really strongly at sustainability, BSC Business, this is our flagship programme on sustainable business practices. 
We also have a strong economics program. And again, you can combine everything from your general economics to economics and econometrics. So if you love data and you love math, this is a really good degree to have and very much in demand. Or you might want to combine it with finance and you'll use our uh, laboratories. Or for those students that perhaps want to go down more the political route, you might want to look at economics and politics. Donald Trump, while he remains in power, uh, there's never a dull day. At the moment, he has started a smart geopolitical war with China, and that's going to affect everything by the value of, say, the dollar. If your currency is then pegged to the dollar, what Donald Trump says matters to how it affects everything in your country. So this is different ways of being able to look at economics. You might be very strong at maths or you might have a weaker math skill. So looking through and having a look at these programmes will determine which part of economics you want to go into. When you're looking further afield and you're looking at what will I do when I graduate, one thing I would say is be interesting to employers. You're going to study in the UK, but do you want to go and spend a year abroad in another country? This might be in one of over 60 partner institutions. Again, having this and having this year of learning a different country, culture will really help you and also galvanise you when you're back in your final year. If you didn't want to do the year abroad, you might want to look at with industrial experience. We will not guarantee placements. What we will do is give you all of the help and support to help you find the jobs, but you will have to go for the interviews, apply for the jobs and work for that year. Every single student who goes on placement is paid. It might be average starting salary or some of our jobs um, that our students get go up to £52,000, which is a very good salary in the UK. We also know that our students who do have this year out tend to perform better and get a better overall grade than those who do not. Also, 50% of students who do go on and do their year abroad, their work experience, will get a job from their employer. So something to think about. And these are the kinds of companies where our students went on placement last year. So really big companies. Um, at the moment, as we're going through a crisis, the big short and uh, videos like that will be shown on Netflix. So you might want to look and research companies like Moody's. I'm sure you've heard of Goldman Sachs. It's one of the big investment banks. But also then you have your big accountancy firms and multinational companies like Johnson & Johnson. In addition to our degrees, Every business school student and university student has the option of enjoying the entrepreneurship pathway where you can do specialist modules. So if you're thinking I want to run my own business, you can put this as part of your degree and you will gain proficiency in entrepreneurship. I think this is a really exciting element to have on your degree. And again, it makes you different and makes you stand out. Here's what our business school looks like. It's a beautiful building. It's made up of three different buildings. You will see there's cafes, lectures. We'll also have specialised laboratories, Thomas Reuter trading room, and you'll have all of these skills as part of your time with us. We also have access to a 24 hour library. I hope that helps. I only have 10 minutes, but if you do have any more questions and you want anything in more depth, please feel free to ask me at any point. This is my email address. Thank you, Rebecca. Excellent. Does anyone have a, a question you'd like to put in the chat box now for Rebecca? Not like we've got any questions just now, but Rebecca, if it's all right with you, we'll be forwarding on any questions that come up and perhaps we can arrange a, uh, a second catch up, maybe a sort of clinic where we can answer questions um, should they come in in the future yeah. sometime. Great. Of course. OK, well, if that's that's all for the questions, I think I'd just like to thank you both again for, for giving us your time uh, today.
that's been really good. And like I say, it's going to be recorded and shared with our other regions. So I'm sure more questions will come out of that as well. Um, and we'll pass that one to you in due course. But uh, thank you very much and have a good weekend. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.